the Mount Sinai Health System in New York City. My colleagues and I have put together a webinar to share some important information and to give some tips on staying healthy during the time of the coronavirus pandemic. We are proud that at Mount Sinai we have successfully discharged over 4,000 patients back home to the community safe and healthy. The members of our department have been busy in the fight against the pandemic, but as the numbers slow down, we are shifting our focus to creating a safe and healthy environment where patients can seek orthopedic treatment. We are gearing up to see patients in the office, via telemedicine, and also into the operating room. In the meantime, we hope you enjoy our webinar on staying safe during the time of shelter at home. Hi, and welcome to Mount Sinai Department of Orthopedic Surgery's webinar series on staying safe in a COVID world. I'm James Gladstone, the Chief of Sports Medicine and the team physician for the U.S. Davis Cup tennis team, as well as a team physician for the U.S. ski team. Today, I wanna to talk to you about the benefits of exercising, and in particular, how to exercise in a confined space. At this point, we're probably all in the same boat, confined to home, going a little bit crazy, not being able to get a haircut, which I desperately need. So building exercise into your routine can help break the boredom, get you healthier, and also, and perhaps as importantly, improve your psychological and emotional well-being during these rather stressful times. We all know that exercise has a real benefit on your physical health. Amongst other things, cardio workouts help control your blood pressure and cholesterol levels and help decrease your resting heart rate, which actually means that your, pump, your heart is pumping oxygen more effectively around your body. It also helps burn calories which in turn helps control your weight, and if it's done well, may even help you lose weight. Finally, it improves your lung capacity. Since you're, ex you're effectively exercising your lungs when you're breathing harder. So what does cardio workouts involve? Well, it's really any exercise that increases your heart rate, makes you breathe harder, and hopefully makes you sweat a little. When you're doing cardio workouts, your goal should be to bring your heart rate up to about 100 beats per minute. Your normal heart resting heart rate is about 60 to 80. So you're actually trying to increase it by about 50%. The next form of exercise that's good for you is strengthening and impact loading. This involves either weight work, which can even be working against your body weight, and some form of jumping, which can be running or brisk walking, including going up and down stairs. This helps build muscle strength and hopefully avoid losing muscle mass, which in turn helps with things like osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is the development of more fragile bones which means that you're at greater risk of fracturing or breaking a bone if you fall. But muscle strength also gives you better control over your joints and better balance, and therefore aids in helping to prevent injuries. Finally, the last form of exercise that you should include in any routine is flexibility, which is basically stretching exercises. As we get older, we get stiffer, and stiffer joints don't work as well, hurt more, and can be a harbinger of arthritis. Flexibility training helps lubricate your joints, improves your coordination and balance, and in conjunction with strengthening, aids in preventing injury. We've unfortunately seen that comorbidities such as obesity, COPD, asthma, diabetes, and high blood pressure, all have led to worse reactions in people who develop COVID infections. So regular exercising 
can be a benefit here as well. So now comes the fun part. How can we exercise in these times of corona confinement? The simplest way, if you're able to, is to put on a mask and take a walk around the block. If you can't do that and have a hallway in your building, then walk up and down the hallway. And even better yet, if there's a stairwell, do a few flights of stairs. If you can't do any of these things, then do some laps around your apartment. The main thing is to move and keep moving. In fact, there was a recent study in the Journal of the American Medical Association, known as JAMA, which is one of the most prestigious journals in medicine, that looked at 9,000 people over a 12 year period. And guess what? People who walked 8,000 steps a day or more had a 50% less chance of dying than people who walked 4,000 steps or less over that time period. So the main take home message there is movement is life. Also, if you're lucky enough to have a stationary bike, a treadmill or a rowing machine at home, then use that because in doing so, you're getting both a cardio and strength workout combined. I now wanna demonstrate well, I actually have some much prettier people than me to demonstrate, but a series of exercises that you can do in your home that don't require any space and don't require any equipment. The last thing I want to discuss before demonstrating these, ex these exercises is how much to exercise. I think if you can do some form of exercise three times a week, you're doing well. If you're someone who typically works out more regularly than that, then try to follow your non-corona time schedule. And if you're someone who doesn't really do anything, then start doing something and build up gradually. It's always great to start a workout routine off by loosening things up with some flexibility and stretching. Move your head to loosen your neck, Move your shoulders in circles to loosen up the shoulders. Stretch out the back of the shoulder by coming across your body. Put your arm behind your back and stretch the front and lower part of the shoulder. And then work your way down. Leaning over like this helps your lower back and stretches out your hamstrings. Hold the chair for support. And if you can pull your leg up behind you, that helps stretch out your quadriceps. By pulling your legs in and leaning over, you stretch your lower back and your inner thighs. This is also a great stretching exercise. Now we move into some strengthening. This is a wall push-up. You're using your body weight as resistance. Just go back and forth, nice and slow. Here's being a little creative. Use some cans from the pantry as weights and work on your arm muscles. You can work on your biceps, your triceps, and by going overhead, your shoulder musculature. Make sure everything you do is slow and restrained. That way you're working the muscles both going up and going down. Here you can start working on some cardio. Run in place, very helpful, and works on both your core and your butt muscles. Now I'm gonna show you three different types of squats to do, and pick the one that's best for you. You can hold the chair, you can stand up from a chair. Again, go up slowly and come down slowly. Control helps with the resistance and the strength. This is a wall squat, one of the exercises I love best. Don't go down too low, especially if your knees hurt, and hold it until your quads start trembling. This is a toe raise. It works on your calf muscles, called the gastrocnemius. Nice way to both stretch and strengthen. This is another great, easy exercise for your quadriceps and for your core. Lift your leg up to the level of the bent leg and hold it there. 
Come down slowly and do it again. This exercise now, the side up, is great for your butt and the thigh muscles. Again, hold it up and keep it up. Now let's work on some core. This is a modified sit-up. Bring your shoulders up as far as they'll go and hold it there. It works on your stomach muscles. Keep your legs bent. And finally, for those who can do it, a plank is a wonderful exercise for quad control. Put yourself into this position and hold it as long as you can. Wow, I got so sweaty from those exercises that I had to take off my sweatshirt. Hopefully I've given you a framework with which to exercise in a smaller space. It doesn't take much and it certainly does you good. In these times of uncertainty, it's great to have some kind of routine to keep you both mentally and physically sane. So be kind to others, be kind to yourself by exercising, stay safe, stay healthy, we're all hoping for the time soon that we can get back outside. It's been a pleasure. Hi everyone. My name is Wesley Bronson. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and today I'll be talking briefly about a common problem many people face, especially nowadays, low back pain. Low back pain is extremely common. So if you've ever experienced an episode of low back pain or are currently dealing with it, you aren't alone. In fact, about 10 to 30% of people tend to experience an episode of low back pain annually. And over the course of their lifetime, up to 80% of adults will have some episode of low back pain. Many patients wonder, well, where's my pain coming from? Why am I having this flare of low back pain? Or why has my pain been going on for so long? Well, it's important to remember that back pain is really a symptom. It's not itself a diagnosis and there are many causes of low back pain. Sometimes it can be very painful and patients often endorse feeling like their back is in spasm. They may have difficulty changing positions or sitting for too long. And occasionally the pain may radiate even slightly below the belt line into the buttocks or even into the hamstrings. Common causes include lumbosacral muscle strains or age-related arthritis can also cause pain as the joints in the back or the discs within the spine experience age-related wear and tear. Other common diagnoses are herniated discs. While this commonly causes low back pain, it can also result in other symptoms of having a pinched nerve and cause pain going down the legs. Patients may endorse so-called sciatica type pains when this happens. There are many other common causes as well, but despite the wide range of causes, the end result is often pain in the low back. One thing that's important to note is that sometimes it isn't just back pain, and so you need to pay attention to your symptoms. If you're experiencing any pain, weakness, or numbness below the belt line, that's a sign that you should contact a healthcare professional to discuss your symptoms. Additionally, patients with so-called red flags should seek treatment as well, including those with progressive loss of strength or sensation, incontinence, significant trauma such as a fall, fevers, recent spinal surgery, or those on immunosuppression medications, or a history of cancer. Any patients with these conditions should speak to their healthcare provider. Many patients may be wondering, well, why now? I haven't really been doing all that much, so why am I experiencing these symptoms? One answer may simply just be bad luck. We don't always have the exact reason for why a particular flare of pain is happening. Maybe you twisted your back or picked up something awkwardly, or for whatever unfortunate reason, your back just decided to act up now. Some studies have shown that significant force is transmitted through your spine when sitting, and prolonged sitting might be bothering you. And now that we're home sitting doing work a lot of the day, perhaps it is what's causing your back to act up. This type of inactivity can cause irritation. Alternatively, maybe now you're home with your family all day and you're working out and doing more activities than usual. Finally, stress also plays a significant role for acute and chronic low back pain, and these are understandably stressful times. So how can you prevent these symptoms? Well, first, there are some basic everyday things you can do while working at home. Remember that posture is important. Sitting in a comfortable chair upright with your shoulders relaxed and your 
computer at eye level will help. Alternatively, slouching and poor posture can cause increased pressure on certain parts of your low back. While working, take frequent breaks, walk around, stay moving. If you find that sitting bothers you, try a standing desk or just work from standing for a period of time. If you're someone who experiences low back pain or wants to prevent it, certain lifestyle factors are important. Smoking and obesity are well-known risk factors for increasing disc degeneration and causing low back pain. Perhaps this is an opportunity to decrease or quit smoking or to lose weight. Non-impact aerobic exercises is also great for your back. A stationary bike or elliptical if you have one, or just go for a long walk. But the important thing is to stay active. Some ways to stay active include activities such as yoga or even practicing mindful, mindfulness and meditation. Anything that stretches your back and lower extremities can go a long way to helping eliminate current pains or help prevent future episodes of low back pain. Often, for patients experiencing chronic low back pain, meaning those for six weeks or more, a formal trial of physical therapy can be very helpful. However, currently there are other ways to do your physical therapy rather than going into the physical therapy office if you're concerned about doing so. Many physical therapists are offering virtual physical therapy and can help walk you through your exercises. Alternatively, many exercises can simply be performed at home. Here are a few examples of exercises you can do on your own at home without any special equipment. Performing and holding positions such as pelvic tilts by pressing your back into the ground, trunk rotations by rolling your knees side to side, bringing your knees to your chest, bridges, prayer stretch, and hamstring stretching, are a few of the types of ways you can stretch and strengthen your core and back muscles. Finally, some simple over-the-counter medications can provide exceptional pain relief, such as acetaminophen or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, or NSAIDs. Sometimes your physician may prescribe a short course of muscle relaxant for an acute episode. In general, narcotic medications should try and be avoided and you should always make sure that it's safe for you to take any medications before doing so. The good news is that most acute episodes of low back pain will get better on their own with time. It may take a few weeks to fully get better, but in general, it should. If you have any concern, you can always call your primary care physician or physiatrist or spine specialist. Thank you for joining me for this webinar. Hopefully you found it helpful or picked up a few tips for managing your own back pain. If you or anyone you know is experiencing any spine-related problems, you can always reach out to my office to schedule an in-office or virtual medicine visit. Stay safe, everyone. Hello, my name is Aruna Senavratna, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon specializing in shoulder knee surgery and sports medicine at Mount Sinai Faculty Practice. Today, I'd like to talk to you about home management of common orthopedic problems, osteoarthritis, shoulder pain, and knee pain. Exercise has many benefits, including boosting one's immunity. There have been studies that show that uh, e uh, vigorous exercise leads to improved immunity against viruses. In addition, aerobic conditioning, uh, strength maintenance, and weight maintenance are some of the benefits of exercise. Exercising outdoors, I've been asked by many patients whether they should wear a mask. Now it really comes down to state policy and politeness and not really spread of the virus, according to some studies. New York State does not have a masking policy for exercise and masks may in increase your workload of breathing and make it more difficult to breathe, especially in sports such as running and cycling. In addition, they can get soiled with fluids and cause some issues. So if you do want to go out using a face covering, you may want to use a gaiter such as this cyclist depicted here. More importantly, you should adhere to social distancing measures. Stay six feet away whenever possible from when you're passing another cyclist or runner and cover your mouth when you're sneezing or coughing. Wash your hands when you return indoors. These measures will go towards the uh, help of reducing the spread of the coronavirus. Another question I get asked is whether you should stretch or warm up before a bout of exercise. It really is the warm up is more beneficial before an exercise and stretching is better.
best after an exercise routine. Warming up improves blood flow to muscles and it reduces the incidence of injuries. As the temperature increases, blood holds on to less oxygen and it frees up into the muscles for usage. Stretching is best after an exercise because it will give you more time to stretch most of the muscle groups. Another question I get from patients is whether ice or heat is to be used in a certain situation. So I believe that ice helps acute injuries and heat helps chronic injuries. Ice works by constricting blood vessels and reducing their caliber and reducing the amount of inflammatory humors or materials that are being released to an injured area. It also works by reducing the conduction velocity of nerve impulses from the injured tissue to your brain, giving one a sense of lowered perception of pain. Um, heat, on the other hand, can have the opposite effect. However, in chronic injuries, it helps relax collagen structures, improves tight, stiff joints, and helps them to move more freely. It may also give a sense of comfort in some situations into an acutely injured area, but use it with caution as it may worsen the swelling or inflammation. Osteoarthritis is a condition that affects many joints, including shoulder, hip, and knees, amongst other joints. It's usually in the older individual over age of 60. It occurs due to genetic and environmental factors, and it occurs when this thin layer of cartilage wears away. It results in pain, stiff joints, and a reduced range of motion. Managing osteoarthritis at home involves managing pain and swelling, inflammation, as well as flare-ups. To do that, the acronym RICE comes into play. Rest, ice, elevate, uh, and use NSAIDs or Tylenol for those who cannot tolerate NSAIDs. Topical creams such as Biofreeze or Icy Hot can also help. Managing stiff joints, usually by using moist heat uh, first thing in the morning will help you have a more comfortable day. Gentle stretching and range of motions also uh, help. When it comes to longer term management of osteoarthritis at home, uh, one can begin with muscle strengthening exercises like depicted here in these uh, diagrams. In addition, weight loss uh, is also important. One pound is like four pounds through a weight-bearing joint, such as the hip or the knee. Using gentle non-impact cardiovascular exercises, such as cycling, elliptical machines, stair climbers, or rowing machine is uh, useful. Watching your diet, obviously, will help with weight loss, caloric intake, as well as diet has also shown to have some anti-inflammatory effects, as well as pro-inflammatory effects in certain foods. Shoulder pain, and uh, as we stay at home during this uh, pandemic, uh, we are working at home, and that can lead to poor posture due to poor ergonomics of your workspace at home. So make sure that those are properly set up. Uh, as we stay home, some of us will increase our exercise load, lead, leading to overuse injuries and inflammation. And as we stay at home, we can fall at home or uh, while exercising outdoors. Sources of shoulder pain are, can come from bursitis, which is inflammation of the bursa around the shoulder, rotator cuff, which is a group of tendons. You can get inflammation of that, leading to rotator cuff tendonitis. Biceps tendonitis, which is uh, also another tendon that's around the shoulder. AC joint or your acromioclavicular joint can get inflamed or become arthritic. You may have shoulder joint arthritis, and we talked about managing that a minute ago. Uh, you could get fractures or tears of tissues, such as a rotator cuff or a labrum. And uh, certainly with poor posture, a pain arising from a pinched nerve in the neck can mimic shoulder pain. And shoulder pain at home. Regardless of what structure or tissue is injured, the first step is to control the pain. So again, our good friend Rice comes into play, rest, ice, uh, elevation, you, removing any rings if there's a lot of swelling is important, and NSAIDs. Now in terms of ice, you can use ice pack, frozen peas that contour well to your shoulder joint, or simply using uh, ice in a Ziploc bag. 
on to the knee again staying at home has some special challenges and as we increase our exercise load it can lead to overuse and inflammation with possible injury and if you're exercising outdoors running on uneven surfaces it can lead to knee injuries um, and falls can lead to tears of the meniscus tendons and even friends. the sources of knee pain include tendonitis of the hamstring tendons patella tendon quad tendon bursitis pre patella bursitis pes anterior bursitis these are all some of the bursas around the knee meniscus tears can occur, occur if you have a twisting injury knee arthritis fractures of the patella femur or tibia which are uncommon but you would require a fair, fairly significant traumatic event for that Tears of the patella tendon, contraceptive tendons uh, can also occur. We manage knee pain at home again, regardless of what structure is injured. The first step is to control the pain with our old friend Rice. Rest, ice, and elevate. Topical creams and gels such as icy hot biofreeze again come into play, and NSAIDs and you know, Tylenol help. If, of course, in any of these conditions, if the pain does not improve, please seek. A medical help within a week or so or sooner if needed thank you for your attention uh, i hope this has been helpful stay safe and if you need to consult us please do so take care now bye bye hello my name is dr sean anthony and i'm a shoulder knee and sports surgeon at the orthopedic center at mount sinai west today i'll be presenting a webinar on the home office Tips for Comfort, Productivity, and Injury Prevention. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced us to shift our workspaces from the office to our homes, and with this comes the challenge of finding a good home workspace. This can be especially difficult when also caring for our loved ones while working at home. With the increased use of the home office, we are seeing a rise in orthopedic complaints associated with poor work environments. These include shoulder pain from rotator cuff and biceps tendonitis, hip and knee pain from quad and patellar tendonitis are frequent complaints, as well as neck and low back pain. Many of these are preventable with a few simple changes to the home office environment. In this webinar, I'll now go through four tips for home office comfort, productivity, and injury prevention. First, find a dedicated home office space. This can be challenging with families and roommates all home together at the same time. But the home office doesn't necessarily have to be a separate room, but it should have the basic components such as adequate lighting, adjustable chair, and a flat table surface. Most importantly, avoid the bed or couch as these have the highest associations with injuries. Second, create a comfortable workspace. The laptop or desktop monitor should be positioned at or slightly below eye level. An adjustable chair is ideal so that the wrist can be kept level and the feet supported or flat on the floor. I'm frequently asked by patients whether a standing desk is better than a sitting desk. If possible, it's best to combine both throughout a workday, as each can cause issues after prolonged periods of time. Third, maintain good posture while working. It's easy to forget good posture and slouch in a chair. Some easy tips to remember are to keep the ears positioned over the shoulders and the shoulders positioned over the hips. This will keep the spine in good alignment while sitting for long periods. The hips and knees should be bent approximately 90 degrees. A cushion can be added for lower lumbar support. And try to keep frequently used objects such as a telephone or scanner within reach as the repetitive straining to reach for items can cause overuse injuries. Finally, take breaks, eat well, and exercise. If you don't already, introduce 10 minutes of morning and evening stretches to maintain flexibility. Of all things, tight muscles from prolonged sitting are the most frequent cause of joint pain due to the increased stress across joints. A foam roller is especially helpful for a tight IT band, quads, and hamstrings, and to maintain flexibility. Throughout the day, stay hydrated and eat healthy snacks. Take breaks and walk around the room during phone calls. Set timers for stand-up reminders. While gyms may be closed, you can introduce bodyweight strengthening exercises, such as wall squats, which are great for core and quad strengthening. Jumping jacks and running in place are good ways to maintain cardio while indoors. By introducing these simple tips to your own home office, you'll be more comfortable, productive, stay healthy, and prevent injuries. Thank you for joining me today in this webinar. If you have any questions or if you're experiencing any joint pain, please reach out to my office to schedule an in-office or virtual video visit. Thanks again. Stay safe and stay well. Hi, my name is Dr. Melissa Lieber. 
and I practice sports medicine in the Department of Orthopedics. Today, I will be talking to you about hydration and nutrition during the COVID pandemic. I also work as an ER doctor, so I have a lot of experience working on the front lines during this pandemic. First, I'm gonna talk about vitamin C. I'm sure many of you have heard this mentioned in the media and in the news. Vitamin C is one of those things that we never normally think about because the average person has no trouble maintaining normal levels of vitamin C in their bodies, just from normal dietary intake. But when the body is under stress, whether it be physical stress from being sick or mental stress from being stressed out like many of us are right now, it requires more vitamin C. And we know this by checking vitamin C levels in critically ill patients and in patients who have a lot of anxiety, and they use up more vitamin C than the average person. This was a study done um, in October 1999, and it looked at the effects of high dose vitamin C uh, on patients who had cold and flu-like symptoms. Obviously, this was way before the COVID pandemic. In this study, they gave the patients 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C for the first six hours of their symptoms, and then three times daily if symptomatic. In those patients who took high dose of vitamin C, it's decreased their symptoms and course of illness by 85% compared to the control group who did not take high dose vitamin C. And even in patients who were asymptomatic, if they took high dose vitamin C, meaning 1000 milligrams vitamin C three times daily, just as prevention, it actually also helped decrease their symptom course. This was another study done recently on vitamin C in February, 2020. And this was a study of just critically ill ICU patients. And it was shown that vitamin C high doses may shorten the length of their ICU stay as well as may decrease their intubation time, meaning the time that they have a tube down their throat and the time they're on the ventilator is shortened by having high dose vitamin C. The longer the patient was sick, meaning the longer they were on a ventilator, the more benefit it showed. So if a patient was not that ill and only required one to two days of being on a ventilator, then the vitamin C didn't seem to make as much of a difference. One thing to think about with taking vitamin C is if you have a history of kidney stones, vitamin C can induce kidney stones. So you wanna be extra careful. Definitely talk to your primary care doctor about it first. You also could think about taking thiamine, another supplement with the vitamin C, which may help prevent kidney stones. But of course, just like anything else, consult your primary care doctor before starting vitamin C as an outpatient. Otherwise, besides kidney stones, taking vitamin C is relatively low risk. So in conclusion, if you're gonna take vitamin C as an outpatient, meaning you're not admitted to the hospital, then it's good to take about 1,000 milligrams a day um, and you could take that for a prolonged period of time. It in the past has worked for coughs and colds, which has been great, and has also shown to shorten the ICU length of stay and ventilation time on a ventilator. Um, also has been shown to lower blood pressure, and we know that hypertension is one of those chronic medical problems that uh, leads to poor outcomes in COVID. So that could also help and be an extra benefit for people who have hypertension. So bottom line, Vitamin C is being recommended by most institutions in the United States right now. And currently the hospital protocols and institutional standards include vitamin C on them. That could change as things change every week and every month as we learn more and more about this disease. So moving on to zinc. Zinc blocks the replication of all coronaviruses. That has been shown in cell cultures, meaning not in humans, but uh, when looking at cultures, it blocks the replication of coronaviruses. And by the way, coronaviruses are the cause of the common cold. This is a specific kind of coronavirus. We don't know perfectly whether zinc works the same way for COVID-19 as it does uh, for other coronaviruses. But the thought is that SARS-CoV-2, which is the name of this virus, may release iron and that along with a zinc deficiency causes the virus to replicate further and make patients sicker. So that, that thought is that zinc um, may play a big role in how fast this virus uh, makes the patient sick. And so a virus, a zinc, excuse me, supplement may actually help in these patients. The other uh, interesting thing is that some of the studies have shown that zinc may be the source of loss in, of smell and taste. So zinc deficiency could play a big role. So bottom line for zinc 
is that it seems to kill other nasopharyngeal viruses, meaning coughs and colds and sore throats. Um, we don't know exactly if it works for COVID yet, but um, the thought is if we supplement with zinc, it could help to prevent virus replication or the speed with which the virus increases in your body. So the bottom line is, can hurt to take some zinc. I'm sure you've also heard of elderberry. Elderberry um, has no known evidence in treating COVID or other viruses. The thought is that maybe that uh, most elderberry supplements are made with a little bit of zinc in them and vitamin C may be why uh, that thought has come about and why people are taking elderberry. So there's no real downside in taking elderberry. There's certainly no upside either, except for maybe the fact that the ingredients include zinc and vitamin C in them. So you may wanna check your elderberry supplements if you're already taking it to see if it has that in the ingredients. Vitamin D. Um, vitamin D has no known evidence to show that it works. I don't know if you've read about that in the news or the media, but I wanted to cover that supplement as well, but no known evidence to show that it works for viruses or COVID. Alcohol-based mouthwash. So um, definitely there is no ingestion of al alcohol-based mouthwash, but alcohol-based mouthwashes um, have shown to maybe kill some viruses in the back of your throat if you gargle with them. There is no recommendation to ingest them at all, but gargling with them may show some benefit. Um, there's certainly no medical evidence for this, which is why I put a thumbs down on the recommendation. Uh, and also I do not recommend any swallowing of this at all. And so I wanna make that perfectly clear. Diet, diet plays a huge role um, in COVID-19. In really all illnesses and all medical problems in general, uh, when you're morbidly obese, you have worse outcomes. But it has been shown that um, when you're morbidly obese, that means BMI over 40, you have a higher uh, risk of getting ill, higher risk of getting uh, infections, and um, you have an, an, auto, uh, an immune deficiency. And we don't know why there's an immune deficiency for morbidly obese patients, but we just know that it exists. And so two things having to do with dieting and eating healthier. One is, if you're morbidly obese, you have a higher risk of getting infections. And two is, if you're morbidly obese, you have a, a higher risk of mortality if you contract COVID-19. So dieting is very good. Um, if you can get your BMI under 30, that would be great. Uh, BMI between 30 and 40 has not been shown to be detrimental or very, very bad, but BMI less than 30 has been shown to be very good. So in conclusion, Definitely diet and exercise is very good. I didn't mention exercise earlier in this talk, but certainly it can't hurt to build your pulmonary reserve and get out there and exercise, which will also help with weight loss and getting your BMI down. Taking vitamin C supplements definitely won't hurt uh, unless you have a history of kidney stones or at risk for kidney stones. So vi taking vitamin C is recommended as well as taking zinc supplements like we discussed um, as it may play a role in virus replication. For those of you who do get sick, hydrating is very important. So even if you're nauseous or vomiting, um, it's very important to hydrate. It can help make up for losses. So when you're sick, your body requires more fluids um, and make sure to supplement with sodium um, in your home water or with a um, electrolyte re replacement beverage. So that way um, you can make up for any losses from vomiting or diarrhea. Thank you so much for listening to this webinar. And if you have any questions at all, feel free to reach out to the Mount Sinai Department of Orthopedics. Thanks for tuning into our webinar, Staying Safe in the Time of Shelter at Home. We hope we've been able to provide some useful information and tips that you can use in the coming weeks. Here is information on accessing our orthopedic physicians and surgeons. In the meantime, stay safe and stay healthy.